Hi again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Ask the Lawyer. I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com. If you've done any driving around, especially on a day when the weather is nice, you've probably noticed there are a lot of motorcycle riders on the road these days. Unfortunately, more motorcycle riders means more motorcycle accidents. And today, we're going to ask the lawyer to tell us about myths and misconceptions about motorcycle accidents that he thinks need to be debunked. And here to do that for us is attorney Claude Weil of the San Francisco-based law firm Cholos Cholos and Weil. Claude is an avid motorcyclist himself and has uh, helped uh, develop pro-motorcycle legislation. So thank you for taking some time with us today, Claude. I appreciate that. Good, good to talk to you, Rob. I'm going to toss some truths out to you, and I'm going to let you tell me what you have to say about those things. So for, let's start off. Skid marks. Skid marks from a motorcycle prove the speed of the motorcycle. What do you say about that? That is a complete falsehood. There's a myth out there because you can use skids to determine the speed of a car before impact. There's a myth that you can do the same thing with motorcycles, but you can't do that. When a person grabs a handful of front brake, the back wheel of a motorcycle comes up and it lays down a longer skid than you would imagine. So that the skid that you usually have with a motorcycle right before a crash is a rear wheel skid and it is not indicative of the speed of the bike. If it's a front wheel skid, that doesn't take very long for the bike to fall right down. So we get this on almost every case. Oh, did you see the length of the skid mark? Your biker was going so fast. It's not true at all. So we busted that one. Let's move on to the next one then, Claude. Single vehicle motorcycle crashes are always the motorcyclist's fault. What do you say to that? Frankly, single vehicle motorcycle collisions can be the motorcyclist's fault, but we look a lot deeper than that to try to determine if there were other factors involved. It's important to look at the roadway, to look and see if it's a dangerous intersection, to look at the motorcycle itself, to see if perhaps something mechanical failed, and if that failed, whether that was a contributing factor to causing the motorcycle crash. We find more often than not that the devil is in the details and it takes very careful investigation and preparation and preservation of the evidence in order to uh, to, to make these cases um, successful for our clients. Now, not every case lends itself to that. Sometimes it really just is the motorcyclist's fault. But we find in so many cases, it's a combination of factors that have created this collision, not just one person's problem. So it's important to look more deeply than just at the surface information when you first get it. Well, I'll give you an example. I got called by a, a, a guy named Chris, and poor Chris is at home now up in Sacramento, and he's lost his leg. And he doesn't really know what happened to him, but the police report has all sorts of witness statements, and they say he was doing nothing wrong when all of a sudden his bike started to wobble, and then he hit a tree. It's a horrible, horrible, catastrophic event. And what we've done is we've hired a mechanical engineer we are preserving all the evidence we can. We've got the Google photographs of the roadway, and we're going to take that mechanical engineer and go out and inspect the motorcycle. That wasn't as easy as it sounds mm. because the motorcycle was already up for auction. Wow. So we had to pull that bike, get everybody to agree, his insurance company, everybody else, so that we could be in possession of the motorcycle. And then we're very hopeful because that police report is so strong in Chris's favor. We're very hopeful that we're going to find something mechanically wrong with that bike. And that's what we're looking for. But it takes a lawyer who is willing to dig and willing to spend the money and the time. All right. Next on the list. Uh, I, I remember the first time I drove in California, I was shocked by lane splitting. I'd never seen that before. So next on my list is lane splitting by motorcycles is dangerous and it's it's got to be illegal. Well, I think a lot of lawyers in San Francisco like to take motorcycle cases because they tend to be a bit bigger case. But I don't think there are very many in, in the Bay Area or even in California who really like to take cases involving lane splitting. Um, we tend to get referrals from other lawyers because they don't know what to do. Lane splitting not only is safer, but the cases are good and lane splitting is in California legal. It is affirmatively legal and is against the law to impede a motorcycle. Now it's actually affirmatively legal and Governor Brown just signed that law uh, last year and it's really different. So what, what you have to look at is whether or not the motorcyclist was 
proceeding in a manner that was safe and prudent. There used to be guidelines with the California Highway Patrol, and the guidelines were no more than 10 miles an hour faster than traffic, mm. and in, under no circumstances faster than 35 miles an hour. Well, those guidelines are gone. The California Highway Patrol received some criticism back when people thought lane sharing or lane splitting was unsafe. And so the with that criticism, they took their guidelines out. And when the California Highway Patrol took out their guidelines, so did the, uh, the DMV. And they took any guidelines relating to lane splitting out of the motorcycle handbook. So now we have no guidelines in the motorcycle handbook, no guidelines from the CHP. Hmm. But I'll, I'll tell you, I think the guidelines are pretty much the same for safe and prudent. You have to know that, and you also have to know whether your client was indeed lane splitting at the time of the impact. And it's very rare that a motorcyclist is actually lane splitting at the time of the impact because if somebody moves over into their lane, if there was no motorcycle there, that means that that, that errant driver moving into the lane would have hit a car. Hmm. So usually the motorcyclist is just occupying either the leftmost wheel track or the rightmost wheel track, and they're not actually lane splitting at the time of the crash. Usually they're in control of a lane, but maybe they've been lane splitting a while before. So what's important is to find out if your motorcyclist is actually in control of a lane when the other person makes an illegal or unsafe lane change and fails to maintain a proper lookout before doing that. So lane sharing is much safer. The only national studies that have uh, been conducted, what a gentleman named Hurt did the Hurt report back in the 80s for NHTSA, National Highway mm -hmm. Transportation. Anyway, NHTSA, it's a, it's a federal highway safety commission. Right. And Dr. Hurt said lane splitting is safer than leaving motorcyclists in the way of cars. There were too many motorcyclists who were, uh, they were stalling, they were getting in the way of cars and they were getting rear-ended when their bikes were stuck in LA traffic. The, the last time a study was done, I call it the Berkeley study, it's done right over here across the bay in UC Berkeley, and that study definitively states lane splitting is safer, it's better, it gets motorcycles out of the way, it's good for everyone, it reduces congestion, and it reduces the opportunity for motorcycles and cars to interact, which is of course safer for motorcycles. All right, let's continue on our list of motorcycle myth busting. Uh, next up, if a motorcyclist is partially at fault for a collision, for an accident, they can't seek any compensation. That is also an untrue myth. A lot of people come to our office and they say, well, I was partially at fault, Claude. I, I mean, I, I know it's not all my fault, but I was partially at fault, so I, I, I don't know what, what I can do. In California, we have something called comparative negligence. That means that the party who was at fault, if the, if the plaintiff was partially at fault, their award is reduced by the amount of fault that is attributed to, the, to that plaintiff. So that means if we have 100% and their case is worth $500,000 and they're 20% at fault themselves, you have to knock off 20% right off the top and they get 400000 so in a strange scenario where you actually have more than 50%, let's say they're 60% at fault. If a motorcyclist is 60% at fault, but the other driver is 40% at fault, the motorcyclist would still win $200,000. So you can't just give up because you're partially at fault. And jurors are very, very careful to try and be fair to everybody. And if they think one of the parties is more at fault than the other, they will just attribute the right percentage. In California, that works out very fairly. And we take a lot of cases where it looks like there might be comparative fault on the part of the motorcyclist because they deserve a fair shake and, and they deserve compensation, even if it's not 100%. All right, and last one on our list here, Claude, you can count on your insurance company to take care of everything and to have your best interest at heart. Well, sadly, that's also a myth. But fair is fair, an insurance policy is only a contract. And it's a contract that if something happens, we have to pay you money. Your insurance company does not help advocate for you 
and it does not help you try and get damages when you're when you're badly hurt. They don't do that at all. As a matter of fact, insurance companies are really looking after their bottom dollar. If they feel that it's more cost effective to settle your case, let's say the guy in the car where our client is uh, 50% at fault, mm -hmm. the insurance company might just pay for all the damage to the other guy's car and they won't advocate or hire experts or really proceed or dig deeper or try to unearth evidence that that will support your case. And, and most of the time, they do nothing. They, it's really just a contract. It's to pay money because you have bought insurance. And that's all it is. They're not your advocate. If you have a claim and you're injured, you need your own lawyer. You need one person or a law firm that is gonna look after your interests because your insurance company, although they may be friendly, they're really not gonna fight for you. Well, Claude, thank you for uh, making some time and being our motorcycle accident myth buster today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rob. That's gonna do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been attorney Claude Weil of the San Francisco firm Cholos, Cholos and Weil. If you want the best information about motorcycle accidents or you're ready to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, please visit askthelawyers.com and also click on the button at the bottom of the screen so you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks for watching. I'm Rob Rosenthal with askthelawyers.com.